All right. Welcome to the show, Tyler. Thank you very much for talking with me today. Hi, Neely. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. So for anybody who doesn't know you, can you tell us about yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah. My name is Tyler Stableford. I live in Carbondale, Colorado, and um, I'm a newly licensed psychotherapist, uh, licensed professional counselor candidate, and I've been a lifelong climber. Uh, it's been a fun career change for me. I'm 48 and moving into the, you know, operating now in the realm of uh, trauma-focused psychotherapy. And I've been listening to your podcast for, for a long time um, as, a, as a, you know, rock climber, ice climber, and mixed climber and such. So I really enjoyed what you've been doing. And in previous um, careers, I've been the editor at Rock and Ice Magazine and the photo and equipment editor at Climbing Magazine. And I've also been a director and photographer in the outdoor industry and, you know, in the, the larger industry that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, I've been really excited listening to your podcast and yourself as a, as a coach and a nutritionist. Um, it aligns a lot with my passions for, you know, self-optimization and climbing and uh, enjoying life. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for supporting the show and me and being so effusive in your support for me. I really appreciate that. Um, and it's really interesting to hear about how you have like completely changed careers. Like you've had this long, wonderful career in the climbing industry and filmmaking and all of that. And actually, can you tell people where to check you out? Cause you have like a really cool portfolio. Up. Oh, I've got a couple, yeah, you know, websites. And so my, um, directory directing and photography film portfolio is at tylerstableford.com. And my psychotherapy website is stablefordcounseling.com. Yeah. Nice. And so you decided that you wanted to be a therapist at what age? Um, it was a few years ago. So I just finished my uh, you know, master's program in clinical mental health counseling. Um, we have a couple of kids. They're now about 16 and 18, uh, my wife and I. And it was about maybe eight years ago or so I started working as what's called a uh, court appointed special advocate for children in the Glenwood Springs court district here, uh, which is called a CASA volunteer working with abused and neglected kids that are um, navigating the foster care system. It was it just had, you know, for whatever reason, it had been something that I thought would be a really great service for myself and my life and obviously for the kids. And through it, Neely, I learned a lot and I saw that what we're seeing in the criminal justice system with the you know abusive families, lots of drug addiction, incarceration, and the abused kids it was really a family lineages of trauma and mental health and unhealed mental health compounded by poverty. And we're working with some of the hardest cases of you know abuse, addiction, and mental health. I realized, huh, I really like this space. And trauma focused therapy is probably the best, one of the best you know turnkeys for helping work in this space. Because slapping people on the wrist is, you know, certainly a, at times a very useful short-term solution, but it doesn't solve the underlying problems. Yeah. You can't shame people out of their traumas. Yeah. So, so that's I got when you decided, so I, decided I would, yeah, get a degree um, so that I could work. Um, so about half my time I work in community mental health. I work with youth offenders. Um, I work with um, high, high needs youth. Yeah. I've worked with, um, you know, violent offenders, uh, victims and, you know, all, all range of other things. And then I have a half time in private practice where I work with, um, a range of specialties, ketamine assisted therapy and psychedelic assisted therapies, uh, which can be effective for healing, uh, deeper traumas, um, internal family systems therapy and EMDR. Yeah. Wow. That's such a huge, broad, career that you've created for yourself yeah yeah it's been been fun it feels like a new new life for me i guess in some ways there's <laughs> a new you know I'm, I'm learning more than ever at 48 i think i'm more like excited about learning and you know growth than i can remember at any time recently yeah so you love it sounds like yeah it's been really fun except for when i come home and cry on the floor sometimes and feel helpless with some of the <laughs> The clients that I'm working with are some of the hardships that they're going through and their, you know, their pain flows through me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you laugh, but that's serious. That's like the most serious thing to see, especially children going through it, you know? 
Yeah, um, it's hard when I, when I work, you know, about half time with kids. Um, what's hard there is that they're not always empowered to change their situation. So when I see adults and they come into my office, you know, it's it's real. Even if they've been a violent offender and such, it's a relatively, you know, helpful situation in the sense that we can we can move some levers. And if they're coming in and they have the bandwidth and the means to come in and say, hey, I, I'd like to make some improvements in my life. Great. We're already off to the races just by that virtue. But when kids come in, they can't always change their home environments. You know, and we can't necessarily do trauma therapy when they're living still with an abusive parent or family member. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a different, different approach at times. Yeah. And it requires a long view and it requires a lot of compassion. I have to build my own life raft of compassion um, to hold a wider view of, you know, of, yeah of compassion um, for the events in the universe that we don't control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. You're probably constantly doing coaching and therapy on yourself to get through all of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's been nice. I've developed my own, you know, good practice of self-care um, techniques, which I'm always looking to improve, but, um, and I've had those for a while, but I definitely need to bolster them in this line of work. Yeah. So, as it pertains to climbing, um, what, yeah, we're going to talk about mostly therapy and therapeutic techniques and just like mental health as it pertains to climbers. And so do you want to tell me a little bit about the intersection of those two parts of your life? Sure. Th therapy um, and climbing. I started climbing. I guess I was about 14 or so. So I've been climbing for, you know, about 35 years and it's been a, you know, the, just the greatest passion, you know, of my, of my life really, I've been climbing, you know, I'm sure yourself and a lot of listeners can relate. I mean, since I got the, got the hooks in me then, you know, two or three times a week for the last 35 years, you know, whether <laughs> it's at the gym or wherever it is, it's, you know, never not, um, and obviously that's, I've seen that through the courses of, you know, we all have different mental health, you know, struggles and life challenges in life, um, different motivations for, for why we climb in those seasons. I've, I've, it's been interesting for me to watch those change, you know, as young in my teens and lots of testosterone and, and, you know, making a career in my twenties and different things or, um, and now, you know, married with two older teenage kids, um, approaching 50 and it's a different motivations, but I'll say, I just still have so much joy for, for climbing. So yeah, I'm out, you know, ice climbing and mixed climbing here in the winter and rock climbing, um, about as often as I can. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to chat about, you know, your own interest there, or, um, how we can bring more wellness, I think, and, and wellness, you know, understand like probably wellness, um, understanding. Yeah in our sport, in our community. Yeah. And just for reference, do you work with many climbers? It sounds like your practice is a little bit different, but do you? Yeah. My doors are open, you know, to pretty much anyone. Um, I work from, you know, people from the last few months from age 12 to 70, um, outdoor athletes. We have a lot of them here, you know, in Carbondale and Western Colorado. Um, so yes, I do. Um, certainly worked with, you know, um, mountain trauma and grief, um, and loss and different things that way in the outdoor community. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, you know, some who just want to, you know, do performance-based psychology. Yeah. So what kinds of things are you seeing climbers and mountain athletes in general experiencing that they need your help with? It's a good question. Like, First, I want to say, like climbing itself, you know, by and large, it's a tremendously, um, we'll call it a healthy activity. Now, anything can be a medicine or poison, right? Anything to an extreme, whether, you know, it's spirituality to, you know, <clears throat> um, marriage to sports. Um, but climbing itself, you know, has so many innate qualities of like of mental health bolstering, just of wellness in it with time with people. Uh, exercise, you know, often time off of our screens and our devices, time in nature, partnership, uh, challenge. So it has a lot going for it just as its own, you know, self-care mm -hmm. mm -hmm. thing that way. 
and then to your question, you know, what am I seeing with, with climbers? Um, so I don't have, it's not like I see, you know, a, a lot of climbers every day in my, in my practice, but those that I, that I do or that I, you know, that I talk with, um, and it may be the same for you, Neely, as you mentioned in your, in your coaching business, but um, among, let's call it, you know, more of higher end climbers, I certainly see a large self-critic uh, player at work or part at work in their mentalities. Um, also, perhaps an unscientifically validated belief that achievement will bring more happiness. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, the data is pretty clear. If you look at it for the scientific lens, is it true that, you know, you're actually happier, more well in your life if you chart your past accomplishments? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Olympic athletes or others are here to tell us that it doesn't necessarily, there's not a lot of lasting wholeness in the trophy, in the medal. Yeah. Is that true? I mean, I think that some people don't know that. Uh -huh. that you know the struggles that olympic athletes and top athletes go through can you elaborate a little bit on that i mean i don't expect you to give us like stats but just your thoughts on it yeah so it, it's always two things it's never black and white and and i think for us as, as climbers or anything like we'll call it issues or imbalances occur when we over index on one ideology or one belief that okay accomplishment of setting up you know a new a new goal or if i can climb harder somehow i'm going to be happier in my life or it's going to bring me joy um i think it's relatively easy to look at the world of high performers you know include whether it's an academy award winners or grammy winners or whatever and say gosh is it does it really free them from their root causes of of you know pain or self-criticism or feeling worthless so the answer is no, because you can see a high, you know, a high rate of broken relationships, of addiction, um, you know, un unhappiness, depression, these type of things. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not speaking in scientific terms, but I'm sure you see it yourself. And interestingly enough, a lot of high performers, um, and I've seen this in my research, you know, through grad school and beyond, and um, are, they often carry a lot of... Um, lack of deep lack of self-worth and it's a constant striving that propels a certain type of perfectionism um or excellence yeah and i'm not here to judge that right human achievement's full of <laughs> high achievers that when you you know read their biographies or um including um the latest issue of uh summit journal the royal robbins piece you know these high high achiever like him on the dawn wall and such there the wall of early morning light He's just, you know, plagued with self-criticism and jealousy and, you know, a drive that could simply not be met by not enough climbing achievements in the world that could heal, you know, the Royals drive that way. And Tommy Caldwell in the introduction speaks really well, questioning his own motivations for climbing in some of these high levels that way. Yeah. I mean, I was just talking with a client yesterday, a coaching client who, and we are talking about how, you know, she really wants to achieve and she has arbitrary goals about what would make her a good climber, like a really actually strong climber. And there's a certain grade that would do that for her. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about some of her accomplishments and how she felt after them. And, and I hear this a lot actually from clients where they're like, well, I kind of just downgraded it. Cause I didn't think that I could have possibly done that grade anyway. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of disappointed that it took me so long to do it. And, <laughs> you know, like there's very rarely happiness that comes from the achievements. I mean, for me personally, whenever I send anything, I'm just like ecstatic and it can last for months. So I, but yes. I think I'm very yep. different in that way because all the people that I've been talking to, that is not, that is not how they are. Yeah. I, again, it's two things. I think there's absolutely joy in achievement. Um, an analogy, you know, that, that I have is, you know, if you learn to play the piano, you don't just want to, you know, to play chopsticks or Mary had a little lamp forever. Mm -hmm. We all are driven to growth. The imbalance, again, this is where self-awareness is so important, is that anything in an imbalance um, or that's not actually getting us what we say we want becomes maladaptive. That And so if you're, you know, your coaching client 
and I believe I've been here hundreds of times myself mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I'll be happier at this grade, right? I'll be happier at whatever it is, 5'11 climber, 5'12 climber, 5'13 climber. If you gather clear data, you'll probably see two things is, is my guess. One is, yes, you do feel happier and you do have a greater sense of self-worth. You're like, okay, well, I can, I'm, I am capable at these levels, you know, I've got a little more, you know, lighten my step. Um, two, when I look at, at your normal life and your actual wellness, does, does it actually improve your well-being? Like, does that, is your life actually happier? Are the quality of your relationships better? Unlikely. Unlikely unless, here's the key, Neely, unless you have a self-critical part or a self-shaming part, and that has released temporarily when you make an achievement. So a lot of times what we what we think is joy, Neely, is actually the release of self-criticism or the release of the craving for the object. Mm. It's not actually true joy, but it's a, a damn fine sense of relief and mm -hmm. release and celebration because you feel released. Yeah, you're, you're like, oh, sense? I'm so relieved. I'm not sucking anymore. Yeah. I'm not simply failing all the time anymore that is yeah. not the same as wellness as you know wholeness true value and self-worth mm -hmm. yeah. yep okay it feels so, great feels yeah, great, it feels to great not, to not, have your, not have your foot in the fire yeah but just having your foot out of the fire is not in itself a wellness technique does that make sense <laughs> yeah we hold our feet to the fire with our projects or our sense of you know if i climb 513a you know i'm gonna be better or whatever it is Mm -hmm. In a sense, you're holding your foot to the fire. Taking it out of the fire is not the same as, you know, self-care, as wellness, as a rich, yeah, yeah, inner life. Yeah, and climbing's really interesting that way because it is so discreet, and I mean that in like a mathematical way, where it is so numbers oriented, where we can see our accomplishments very clearly on paper. Um, and what I'm realizing working with people is actually that. People aren't, it's not even about the grade. It's about progression. Like people don't, they want a grade, but once they get the grade, what's underneath it is they want to see themselves getting better all of the time, all of the time. And so yes. that's why it never ends is they're like, well, I did a 513A. Now I need to do, do it 513B or C or whatever. And I do the same thing. Like I've right. struggled yeah. with this for a really long time. So I, I guess my question for you is, when you're working with people like this, how do you counsel them? Like, what's the, what's the answer here? <laughs> I think that I could probably give you far, far more like straight answers talking about myself as well. That way, yeah. you know, as, as I've, I can't remember when it was, was it 15 years ago that I, you know, first climbed 513A or whatever. Um, and, you know, I haven't progressed a lot since then. I think maybe I've done a one, 13b some some years ago um and so i have also enjoyed you know that upward progression um like yourself or like your clients there and it's been a process for me um while i still enjoy climbing i think i'm climbing more consistently and and, and better than ever in, in part you know from just freeing myself from expectations or from self-criticism and also from just studying a lot of the better training techniques, much of which are on your podcast, <laughs> which often involves more rest, right? <laughs> than, <laughs> yeah. than climbing at this age, yeah. um, which is the hard part in many ways. It's not hard to go to the gym and climb. It's hard to, hard to not go. Um, but I think one of the biggest things is journaling, bringing self-awareness, feeling and saying, where do I actually get true happiness in this sport? How do I maximize that happiness? And, and I've seen it through a couple of, of, you know, big knee injuries and knee surgeries where I you know, couldn't walk for six weeks and different things that it became clear to me that the real joy is just being out in the outdoors with friends, moving, having challenges. And as I started back at five, eight, five, nine, you know, after not being able to walk for a month and a half, um, I, I realized what a fool I was for putting my happiness in, and like surrendering my happiness to grades, to an external arbitrary object that way. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. I look back at my life, 
um, or if we use our like your impending death as a place in which to stand, look back and like do some clear like scientific data gathering. Like, is it really going to improve your life? Just apply some more perspective. You know, I had to do that to myself. So I realized, oh gosh, not at all. Like, not at all. I do have a part of me when we look at you know the multiplicity of our of our beings of our personality they definitely have a an achieving a striving part that would you know love to see me you know doing better in, mm -hmm. in my in my climbing every month that would be amazing and i have to bring self awareness and say that's only a part of me that thinks that external validation is going to somehow bring deeper internal joy or happiness mm -hmm. and that's a yeah. that's a myth yeah yeah, the external validation I think is huge with all of us. And and something I've been wondering about lately is why? Like why and do I do we think it's just a cultural thing? And are there some cultures that don't value accomplishment and achievement as much as ours do? And by ours I mean like the whole west, like people who are climbing. And because it seems to be like really ingrained in us to want more, because when you said, yeah, I'd love to see myself climbing harder. Well, I think that Adam Ondra would also like to see himself climbing harder and Absolutely. he's the top. So like, where's the end? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is where I come to say that, um, and there's no, no bad thing in itself. It's the, it's an imbalance when one drive um overtakes our you know becomes the captain of our ship in our life that we have to balance with self-awareness and self-leadership you know in our own system a whole number a whole range of drives that may compete you know drive to spend time with family to take days off to go climbing to train uh you know to study to do school or work um other things and also as we start to look more at let's call it deeper into mental health things most of us will probably find we have you know call it a self-critic or a drive to achieve mm -hmm. we also have a part of us that really wants to to at times have relief to numb ourselves out um see in the climbing world quite a bit you know the holy trinity of climbing marijuana alcohol mm -hmm. um that so, and I hold that in two hands because on one side you may have, you know, the striving or the climbing. We also have parts that strive for relief, numbing, dissociation type of things. So nothing in itself is bad per se. Again, it's bringing a new captain to the ship, which is our self-awareness so that um, we can say, yeah, there is a drive to achieve. That's okay. That's normal. It's, it's biological. It's evolutionary. You know, we have to have a, a drive to thrive and to survive under adversity. And we can bring that to our sports. Great. But if that's the captain of the ship, you know, you're going to a, a far off destination where you don't really want to be. And it's mm -hmm. going to not going to end well. Yeah. So then what do we do instead? <laughs> this is where I think, and I'd be interested in your role as a coach too. And I've, I've heard you, you know, working, with some clients too, of gathering more self-awareness. So what we're not aware of, Neely, we can't change. So we have to be bring self-awareness, you know, in the same way if we said, I don't know, I had an angry part that just took me over. I don't know why it was, you know, yelling at my spouse or yelling at my kids or whatever it is, as a hypothetical example. We have to start bringing more awareness and that comes through mindfulness, through journaling, I think is very good practices, writing down things and saying, oh, okay, I noticed I was really agitated or I yelled, huh, what was there? And almost always, Neely, there is a deeper level of wounding dating back to a prior time that's underneath our imbalanced drives, whether it's an imbalanced anger, imbalanced, you know, eating, um, imbalanced, you know, too much climbing or exercise that the outward signs are very clear that lead to injury or overuse. Um, there's always, almost always protecting for some other deeper wounding that is afraid that, you know, we would be seen to be worthless, you know, unvalued, ashamed, um, whatever it was, abandoned from our tribe, which probably was our family or, you know, some loved ones early in our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever I see somebody 
you know, with some type of imbalance. And again, I'm not the judger. It's more if they're coming to me and saying, hey, I want help with this or that. So, okay, great. I don't really diagnose people nearly like with their symptoms. If they say, I have depression, I have anxiety, I have, you know, bipolar or whatever it is. All that to me are just the surface symptoms that are presenting and covering a deeper a deeper wound. That's where I'm always going. So I don't really I don't really subscribe to diagnoses unless they serve a social justice perspective or provide greater access to care mm. for somebody. Otherwise, I have no interest in diagnosing anybody. I'm, I'm I can I notice the symptoms, you know, as well as anybody. But if someone comes in and says I have high anxiety or I'm really self-critical and then I find myself, you know, trying to find relief with whatever it is, ice cream, social media, you know, porn, whatever, alcohol. Um, okay, let's look at why those behaviors are there. Those are just the top, top shelf symptoms. And I'm not even interested necessarily in quote, curing those so much as curing the root causes of those. If we heal the root cause, the surface symptoms will naturally abate. They'll dissolve on their, on their own. Yeah. And I think everybody who's listening is like, how do I heal it? So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to get personal with you yeah. and ask you, like what kinds of things in this regard do you struggle with? And if I may, what was under what is underneath those and what do you do to deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, always happy to share it because um I think it's really important for us to to just be open with our own mental health struggles. And I I really admire that with you on this podcast. And uh, you know, I think I'm seeing it, or I know I'm seeing it you know, among celebrities and top level athletes, it's really wonderful. The new era that we're in of, you know, and sharing, of particularly seeing it. Yeah. Sharing the athletes saying, Hey, I'm really struggling with this, or I really struggle with anxiety, you know, even high performers struggle with it. Um, yeah, I grew up, um, in a, you know, a relatively dysfunctional household and, uh, you know, with alcoholism and, and, and some abuse. And, and so I look at this pretty closely. And when I discovered climbing, in my, in my early teens, nearly, it was such a great, I mean, such a wild, you know, escape, right. From, from many things, but also a, a coming toward of deep friendships, excitement, adventure. And, and I realized at times that, you know, through crises in my life and going to therapy in my twenties, thirties and, you know, and beyond, um, that I was seeking high stress, high risk activities as a way of, you know, feeling alive of uh, relief from other stressful events. Interesting how other stress, <laughs> really stressful yeah. events and climbing and things would provide relief from other stressors. Yeah. Um, but building a lifestyle of high, you know, high achievement, high stress, high function. And it's been fascinating for me. One of my deepest fears when I went and started doing deep work in therapy, I think in my early thirties, maybe even our, uh, our daughter was born, was that I would lose my edge. Right. And, and maybe this is, you know, rings a bell with yourself or other climbers. I was afraid that I would lose my edge as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you know, as a father and breadwinner for family, that if I relaxed that, you know, I'd sit in some yoga pose and uh, be all good and it would all be good. And, and I couldn't let go of that drive of the hypervigilance of the stress and the stress and in, in a sense, which is, you know, fear was providing, um, yeah, constant drive that kept me hyper aware of things out there. And I was fascinated to find, and I think a lot of people have found this too through therapy, that building self-awareness and healing our past wounds actually brings, you know, can actually be sharper. I'm not up as much, you know, at 4 a.m., 2 a.m. with the wheels spinning. I'm not exhausted coming into work fresh. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have a lot more laser focus of intention and attention. Um, and I'm interestingly enough, I was really curious about this nearly, would I still enjoy high end climbing once I, you know, uncoupled myself from that need for at the, that I had in the past for, you know, more extreme level of sports. And I'm fascinated. I still love climbing just as much. And I'm still, I, you know, I've been, been doing some high level ice climbs in, in recent years as well, but I approach them differently without a need for them to like, fulfill me, you know, without a need for the achievement to fulfill me. It's more just the process. Um, and I find myself just as happy turning back from big climbs because just being in the process, then I, I would have been in an earlier life, let's call it before therapy, you know, I probably would have 
you know, kept my, held my foot in the fire to go back to analogy. If I didn't complete a climb, if I didn't succeed, you know, mm -hmm. if I went out to do a big, whatever it is, ice climb in the Canadian Rockies or moonlight buttress where a friend and I went a couple of years ago, um, I would have shamed or blamed myself more. And now I'm like free to just enjoy the process and come wherever I come, you know, and not be worried about the finish line. Yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? It's kind to of you? ironic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really thought I might lose my whole drive for climbing because, oh, I don't need those, that, those stressors anymore, that, you know, relief from, you know, from the burdens I was carrying in my inner system. Um, but no, it turns out to have been the opposite. I feel sharper and brighter, uh, but I also feel more relaxed and free. Yeah. And thank you for sharing all of that. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of people can probably relate with a lot of the things that you were saying. Are there yeah. certain strategies that you use to bring yourself? I mean, obviously you said that you've done therapy and you work on this, but I just think that people are still wondering, like, how do I get where he is? How do I get to enjoying the process more? Well, again, two things. <clears throat> where I am is not a place. It's a process. It's a, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and I still have to row the boat a lot on the stream that I'm in. It's not that I'm resting in a, you know, a certain place. That's um, a great and we all, we all have oscillations, right? It's our lives are always sine waves. What I found is that I have the tools and the techniques now, you know, a lot of that's through, through privilege too of access, you know, mental health care is not easy to access. Um, and I think that's, as a side note, it's part of why I'm really committed to spending at least half my half of my week in community mental health and working with community nonprofit grants to work with the underserved. I think we really I'm digressing a bit, but I think it's also on point that we can only be as well as our communities are. Mm -hmm. And so um I think all of us, you know, benefit by, yeah, we all benefit from each other. We're we're you know, we're all healing ourselves as a community. And if our community is unwell. Um, then we have to do it together, neighbor by neighbor, you know, family yeah. by family. Um, so I, to get back to your question, where, you know, what are the, what are the techniques I'd say, you know, what both latest neuroscience shows, um, you know, and, and psychiatry research, as well as, you know, some of the, personally, some of the spiritual traditions, you know, the Buddhism and Vedanta and different things of the mindfulness and yoga is showing that um, what we is bringing mindfulness is bringing awareness. So, and it, it doesn't have to be any type of religious thing. It doesn't have to be spiritual. You don't have to believe in, you know, in a God with a name of some kind, but more just bringing self-awareness and find out that we can bring mindfulness to what's happening. So one struggle that a lot of people have is if we have anxiety, nobody wants to sit in meditation or mindfulness because guess what we become more mindful of? <laughs> yeah. Anxiety. Oh my gosh, there's more than I thought was here. This is this is terrible. Well, I'm going to turn on the TV, right? I'm going to get back on Instagram because I don't want to be around anxiety. So we kind of have to wait until the pain of of change, you know, the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Um, and so, okay, I want to become mindful of the anxiety or the drives or the unhealthy drives I have, you know, whatever it might be in my life. And from that, then we become able to change because it's only what we're what we are aware of or want to be aware of that, that we can change. So that journaling, um, gratitude practices, um, you know, yoga has been you know science evidence based shown. Obviously, brown skin cultures have known it for thousands of years. As I've found in my grad school research, we have a, a deep cultural bigotry that seems to validate and think that you know self help and psychology started in the 1800s with some. <laughs> privileged old white guys, you know, literally. Yeah. And we, and we type, we seem to think that other cultures simply didn't understand the scientific method of cause and effect data gathering. Um, and what we're seeing of, of course now, which is great to see is that all the latest neuroscience is validating a lot of those techniques of, you know, yoga and mindfulness meditation and those type of self-care techniques. Um, so those are really big, um, but they may increase more discomfort, you know, uh, at the beginning stages as you, as you might know yourself that way you. we have to go through that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What do you find is most helpful in your own self-care or, you know, your, let's call it any, I'm not, I don't know what it is that maybe are your, you know, your top struggles and, you know, in climbing or in your life nearly, but what do you find are the best self-care techniques for yourself? 
Um, well, I'm so grateful that I went through my coaching program because I coach myself all the time where I feel a certain way. I feel frustration. I feel anxiety. And normally I would just like plow through it and numb myself. Like you're talking about, like do something to distract myself so I don't have to feel it. And I think that's what a lot of us do, including with climbing. And now, or I'd shame myself for having the feeling at all. And now I can be like, I am feeling overwhelmed. Okay. And name the feeling. And I am feeling overwhelmed because of these things. Of course, I'm feeling overwhelmed. These things are overwhelming. And just like giving myself a moment to be like, this is real. It's okay. And it's okay. And then telling myself, like, I am legitimately doing the best that I can given the resources that I have right now. And so like going through that process in, in most situations now, and it's become really quick for me where I can acknowledge validate and then like tell myself what I need to hear, which partly comes a little bit from IFS, which we should talk about, but also just from my coaching, um, schooling. So I think that that's one of the biggest things that I use for myself and that I try to teach my coaching clients too. It's so empowering understanding where the feelings are coming from and then feeling them and then letting them be able to pass through me and like giving myself compassion. So I think that that is number one and that doesn't, that's not like a normal self-care strategy, but uh, I think it should be. And I think that the other things sort of gloss over that deeper work. Uh, But I have been doing yoga nidra too. And I've never really liked meditation, like my normal mindfulness meditation, just because I get really bored and anxious, like you said, which may just be a symptom of like my spiritual immaturity, but yoga nidra is really great because somebody just guides you through focusing on all the different parts of your body and relaxing them all. And by the end of it, I'm just like in a different time zone, you know, (laughs) Yes. which carries through to my nervous system being, you know, in a calmer place for the rest of the day and my sleep being better and me being able to handle social interactions better and all of it. So that's two things I would say that are, have been really important lately. And also the sleep thing, like really, really prioritizing sleep. I just wrote an article about it yesterday on a whim about all the things that I've learned about sleep this year. I was like, this will just be a quick blog post. And it ended up being 4,300 words long, which is like a 14 minute read. Yes. (laughs) So I (laughs) apparently have a lot to say about sleep. And I think that it's super important. There's a lot to say. Anyway, yeah. And, and thanks for that upgrade too. on what I said before, when you mentioned, you know, using the guided meditations with yoga nidra, I think I, I almost always listen to guided meditations myself and I wouldn't advise anyone to necessarily as a first time, you know, to navel gaze or count your breathing or that type of thing as your introduction to meditation, nor do mm-hmm. I necessarily think it's, you know, for us in the Western world and our current lifestyles, the best, obviously I'm not saying this as a blanket statement, but there's been some fascinating research. Uh, uh, Tanya Singer at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin did some research, which she, you know, she, I'm sure she had some deep intuitions and could see clear as day from seeing Buddhist monks and meditators, but finding that the Buddhist practice of loving kindness, of compassion, that it actually, when we do a loving kindness meditation, I would say that's probably one of the most effective meditations that any of us can do in our lives, which is wishing well for ourselves, wishing well for our neighbors, and eventually, as we gather the strength, wishing well for our, you know, for our adversaries and, and mm. ones that we struggle with, because what it does is it opens our hearts to gratitude, to spaciousness, to having wider tolerance and our freedom, nearly really in our lives is the amount that we can tolerate in our lives. So this is what you spoke to in your coaching practice. To go back to one other thread I want to pull on that you said really well is for example, let's say I'm working on a 13 minus rock climate main elk here. Um, and I go out, you know, I try it every week or two when I'm out there and I always think, is this going to be the day? Or gosh, what if I don't climb it? I still have those voices. And as I mentioned, it's just that the sign web, the oscillation of those voices is lower, right? I'm not gripped by the, you know, the, the fear, the doubt or the critic or the, you know, the slave driver, 
with a whip saying, I got to do it today. But I still have all those those voices. But one technique I found is really helpful from Michael Singer, the author of The Untethered Soul, is to think about the worst case scenario of, okay, fail on my project and the season ends and tell yourself, I'll be fine with that. I can handle that. I'll be fine with that. That's a top level technique. It doesn't heal the wounding that we spoke about earlier. That's, that's you know, important to do in, in therapy, but it creates more spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, we're creating a self-awareness. What are the voices in my head? What is current currently coming up? You know, okay, I hope I don't slip today. Hope that today's the day. Hope I can be relieved from this project. <laughs> my draw has been hanging on it for three months, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I had a hard week. Oh gosh, am I just going to get up there and fall at the same place again? And the step back to create more spaciousness, more self-compassion is I'll be fine with that. And to see, try that on, you know, don't just say it as an override, but say, oh yeah, I can handle that. Mm -hmm. or I can at least be aware of it and I can hold space for all the emotional ranges that I'm going to have. So what we're doing is stepping back and creating wider self-awareness and wider spaciousness to hold and to nurture whatever in our internal system is coming up. Mm -hmm. That's our self-awareness and our self-compassion coming forward. Yeah, I think so <laughs> a few years ago, I started working on this stuff and I've talked about this before, but maybe not in this much detail with Hazel Finley being my coach. And she would ask me questions like, why do you climb? And I'd be like, because I want to send things. And she'd be like, but actually, why do you climb? And I'd be like, cause I want to send things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so like, I was very, very attached to the outcome. And when you yeah. just said, well, I would be okay with not sending it. There's a part of a lot of people I think who are like, uh, no, I would not be okay with it. Like, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. My best is not good enough, you know? And so I think there needs to also be some deeper work, which you, I know, do with people where we, we come to terms with it actually being okay that we don't send. Because for me, like when we were talking about our, your deeper traumas earlier, what comes up for me is like, you know, I was born into a family where my sister hated me from the moment I was born. And so and she told me that every day of my life by yeah. either just fully rejecting me, telling me I was stupid, um, beating me up, like whatever it was. And we still don't talk to this day. So that's been like a huge formative thing in my life where I need respect from others. I need people to like me, you know? Um, and that comes from external validation. And so as a climber, we get respect from sending things. And I had to really reevaluate that and think about what I actually respect about people at the crag. And Hazel really helped me do this. I was like, well, I actually respect people who are nice to me and who are kind to themselves and who are patient with the process and who are just like chill to be around. And so that helped me reevaluate what I actually value about climbing and what is respectable. And then understanding even more deeply that it doesn't matter what I climb, that I have value as a person simply by existing. And that I think was the biggest one. And that came to me when my friend Lisi actually said it to me. She was like, you have value just by existing. And I was like, I have literally never even thought that that was a possibility. And uh, that I think- What age was this? This <laughs> was, old are you, when... you know, 43. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's funny, the wisdom we learn, right? <laughs> and like, Later I in can, our lives. <laughs> I can yeah. hear that and on an intellectual level be like, okay, I can sort of believe that, but it took me a while to actually internalize it. And now- that I've internalized it and chosen to internalize it because obviously that's a better way to exist. Now I can go to rock climbs and be like, this doesn't matter and legitimately feel that. But I think it took that much deeper work to get to that place. Yeah. I worked for several months um, during my last year of grad school as an intern therapist at Jay Walker Lodge Addiction Center here in Carbondale. It's residential addiction center for for men of a whole range of ages um and most of them showing up have had pretty darn severe addiction to all manner of substances um, and it's not their first 
time around in the recovery space. And so they've, you know, wrecked their lives in many different ways. Uh, and one thing that was fascinating for me to see, Neely, is we would do group therapy and talk about their family of origin and their upbringing almost to a man, every person, this continues to be the case of people who come into my office, will underplay the, we'll call it the trauma of their childhoods. And I don't mean that there was, you know, there had to be beatings or abuse or sexual assault or those things, there may or may not have been. But by trauma, I mean, you know, coping mechanisms that we, that we developed, you know, from a, a very difficult, you know, abrasive sibling or other things that way. No one makes it out of childhood without these slights and i'm not I'm not here to say that you know none of us should have trauma it's it's just it's what's things that exist but my point is it makes perfect sense from an attachment lens if you look at the animal world you know or human world we have to attach to our tribe to our family if we mm -hmm. don't we will be in and not too long ago in our human history you know buried alive killed left behind as a child not fed you know certainly that's, we see that in the animal world too so we have to attach no matter how bad the circumstances are. And number two, we have to underplay the difficulties that we're going through. So as you described, perhaps growing up in your household and with your sibling, you may have had to underplay or you very likely had to because you had to survive in that household for food, shelter, clothing, you know, and you have to attach to your tribe there no matter how bad it is. Mm -hmm. so that's very adaptive at the time, Neely it becomes maladaptive and no longer serves you when you are now, let's say with an intimate partner, you know, you've both chosen each other. And now what happens when you feel a slight of not being, you know, respected or, you know, a comment from oh, your it's partner. A problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a problem, not only for you, but probably for the whole system, probably mm -hmm. for all three of you. And by that, I mean you, your partner and the relationship, <laughs> yeah. which we view as a third entity. That's normal. It's our, you know, I think it's kind of our process in our adulthoods um, to do that. I have a like a, a pet theory that like evolution, right? Doesn't we never needed great mental health to survive? If you see evolution and, and survival as being able to, you know, survive old enough to mate, to reproduce, and to raise kids that can then live long enough to reproduce, our mental health is not that important. And, and hypervigilance and self criticism and these type of things might have actually increased our ability to survive, you know, in, in difficult circumstances growing up in our evolutions as, as humans. But it doesn't serve us now in the societies that we're in. And now you and I are in our 40s. And, you know, we're not threatened by those same things. And most people were dead by their, you know, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. And now we have almost a whole second life, where mental wellness is really, really important. And it actually does kill us. The stats are very clear. Those with mental health disorders die on average 10 years, 10 years younger. Mm. There's a lot of good scientific evidence why you don't want to ignore anxiety, depression, you know, eating disorders, whatever it is, or other things and, and sweep them under the rug. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's compelling right there. Yeah. I think you probably just got yourself a few new clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, most people don't believe that healing is possible either. And I didn't necessarily, right? Like oh, I've lived with anxiety or you, you know, you've lived with, let's say a hidden lack of self-worth. No one wants to feel that. And you couldn't feel that in your childhood or it would literally, you know, cause you dis-ease, you know, or ailments or you know, kill you slowly. Most of us don't believe that healing's possible because we've lived with it since a lot of times pre-verbal stages of whatever it was that we've learned from a parent. It's not okay to have to behave like a child. It's not okay to have needs. Oh, self-criticism and striving and being parentified to meet our parents' needs rather than our own is more important. Mm -hmm. Okay, when did we learn that having external validation or meeting others' needs is more important than meeting our own? Yeah can't heal that stuff very easily on your own. I wish you could. <laughs> yeah. And I think it just takes practice. And this is what I'm constantly talking to my coaching clients about is like, okay, well, how do we get to the point where we don't need the external validation as much even And my homework to people is constantly like, all right, well, at the end of the day, talk to yourself about what you did accomplish and pat yourself on the back for it. And like, really let yourself feel that which I do every night before I go to bed while I'm going to bed. It's like, I did this, I did this, I did this. And if it's with climbing, I'm like, I tried really hard. I found a new foot. I memorized the crux. I, uh, 
breathed. I like all these tiny little things that add up to accomplishment, which is what we want. We want validation for things that we've done. And we're not usually going to get it from other people. Like it just usually doesn't happen. It's not part of our culture very often to at least go into detail about what they think you're so awesome for. You have to do it yourself. And that's also not well thought of in our culture to like give ourselves props, but that's exactly what I'm telling people to do. And what I've been doing too. If you lived in my house, you'd be like, wow, you are so conceited this morning. I was talking to my husband about, I want to start a YouTube channel. I want to be like a YouTube phenom. This is my new thing. And uh-huh. I know it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of not. And he's we're doing like, it right now. We're recording a video. Yeah, we're doing it right now. <laughs> and I was like, I'm a very capable person. And people generally like me. I I can make this happen. <laughs> and I think if most people heard a person say that, they'd be like, You are you have an ego. Um, but for me, it's more of like I'm trying to go against what I normally say and think about myself so that I can heal from all of this. And I think that we all should. Yeah. And you said something very important. And not only are you going against what you say and think about yourself, but you said that as you do your validations, you let yourself feel them and you Mm -hmm. point into your chest. And that's critically important because if is the trauma expert, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the best-selling book, uh, the body keeps the score. Mm, Yeah. He's a research psychiatrist and author in Boston and been really foundational for bringing awareness to some of the harder you know, cases of healing from trauma. But he says, if we could have thought ourselves, thought our way out of our stupid thoughts, if we could think our way out of our st- stupid thoughts, we would have, but we can't. And so that's where it's really important where you said you have to feel those validations. We mm-hmm. have to go in what we call somatically or into our body to feel it because we simply cannot at a top level, think ourselves out of, you know, our, our, thinking because research shows our thoughts are actually a product of guess what our emotions Mm. so when we look at someone who if i were to i don't know give you a stimulus of some kind you know a trigger that you know makes you angry you'd find out that you actually had a bodily sensation or an emotion before you had the thought of anger Mm. so i'm glad to hear you say that you're going in and saying can i let myself feel validated yeah it's very important And I don't know if you have this experience, but I'm finding that men have more of a problem, a more challenge with letting themselves actually feel it. They're often Mm -hmm. being like, I don't, I don't need to, like, it's fine. I I don't need to feel the. Correct. Yeah. And it also comes back to what I was saying that most, you know, particularly working with men in the addiction space, they underplay the level of emotional vulnerability that they had in their childhoods mm-hmm. through no fault of their own. It wasn't even necessarily a conscious choice. I think it, um, I, I don't know exactly why, but I, I do see the same, same thing you're seeing. You know? Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's clear that our culture really shames boys for feeling things or showing emotion a lot more than they shame girls. And so that just carries through into our adulthood. So yeah it's yeah. tough out there yeah yeah it is tough out there um and there's a lot of great hope i would say it's, it's not that it's not that our world is waiting for more information necessarily i mean obviously we can i would love to for us to discover more efficient and less expensive healing techniques so we are kind of sense waiting for that but all that the self-help that we need right now is that information you know that we're going to get is so widely available what i would say you know, to myself too, it's a matter of, okay, this is what I tell my clients, particularly after we do something like ketamine assisted therapy, you know, for treatment of depression or suicidality or other things like that. Ketamine is a very powerful psychedelic at certain doses and you can, you know, leave the solar system and tour the cosmos in all different ways. So I'm not concerned about how big your experience is here. What I care about is would a video camera record you walking differently, talking differently, doing the habits that well people do, like self-care people do after this treatment. Will you have the ability to do the you know loving kindness meditations, to do like what you're talking about? Can I feel the self-validations? Can I take more time in nature? Can I turn off my phone, spend time with my loved ones, you know, 
turn off the phones, play a board board game in the evening, make a nice dinner together, whatever it is, do the things. I really don't care about how powerful are the individual healing steps that we do during our therapy time together, because that's even that itself is not necessarily going to sustain you. It's the opening of the doorway for you to walk through and to create a new room, you know, a new life on the other side. Yeah. Well, and do, I mean, we haven't even talked about this and we really were wanting to about all the different modalities that you do use. So you said ketamine mm. and other psychedelic therapeutics, yeah. but also you use IFS and some other IFS. things you want to talk yeah. about that. We'll put a, a brief thing in it. Cause I think it's helpful for people to know, and we can have some resources, um, you know, speaking personally, obviously not as the, you know, the decider of all mental health techniques, but for like Internal Family Systems, which you were calling IFS, was developed by Richard Schwartz about 40 years ago, a uh, family systems theorist and, psych and research psychologist. Um, essentially, he claims that we have an internal system of parts or drives in ourselves. And so when we say, oh, I'm driven by ego, what we would see if we brought that a closer look is that ego can come in many different forms. It can come in you know, a self-critic, grandiosity, narcissism, you know, lack of empathy for others, different things. It's not just one thing. And if we do go back to like, you know, researchers, Freud was definitely on to multiplicity, you know, Carl Jung and many others realized that we have multiple drives. Um, and Freud backed away from it because he thought it would be too controversial for his time. But it's now an evidence-based, you know, therapy. I find the reason I'm talking about it is I find it wildly helpful for us, mm -hmm. particularly as climbers. Yeah. To look at our multiple drives that way. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, just as you mentioned, um, I was charting a few as you were talking about Neely there, but I think speaking generically as climbers, let's just say we have a self-critic who drives us and says, got to do better, got to do better. We also have, there's going to be some release valve for that self-critic. We can't just live in self-criticism all the time. So there's going to be something that then takes us away from that self-criticism or anxiety, which is often, we'll call it a relief-seeking part of us, you know, whatever that is. I mentioned those before, you know, it's social media and substances, behaviors, different things. And always underneath that self-critic is just a top shelf character that's trying its very best to protect you from ever feeling a deeper wound or a burden that you're carrying, which is some sense of worthlessness or invalidation. Mm -hmm. And the good news is we have a self-awareness because just by virtue of knowing that, oh, I have a self-critic part. And then I also have a part of me that hates that self-critic or w wishes it didn't wake me up at, you know, 4 a.m. saying you haven't done enough or you need to do this or why didn't you do that yesterday, you know? you're a terrible person. Okay, we have multiplicity, we have competing interests. And these top level competing drives can never in themselves solve the wounds that they're trying to shield us from or protect us from. They're doing their very best. But the good news is, uh, you know, a lot of different therapy modalities, but particularly internal family systems therapy can take the express lane as fast as your system is willing to go, which could be relatively slow. But to help heal the underlying wounds that we carried from our earlier lives or from our, you know, family generational epigenetics, let's call it. Mm -hmm. And then it's off. It's always our most playful, most innocent, most fun loving parts of us that were buried and that were wounded. So I'm quite sure Neely, as you described the torment from your sister, you know, from your perspective, that it was the most playful aspects of your personality, the innocence, the freedom to whatever it might be, you know, or, playing with Legos, playing with dolls, singing, doing cartwheels, talking to yourself in your room. I'm quite sure if we rolled the tape back, you'd find that, you know, you saw your sister criticizing you at times of innocence, playfulness, vulnerability. Those parts get buried. And, but those, those are the most innocent parts of you. The most playful parts are now the most wounded. Why? We don't know. It's just the system that we've charted, you know, through this, through this research-based modality. Uh, and the great news is we can use our self-awareness, our self-energy, and no matter how tortured our upbringings have been, um, Richard Schwartz and others have found that we have a self-energy that is just there, and it's it's very kind and loving, and that's the attachment that we use. And as an example, I hear from 
you know, in being in, in some, some work environments with special forces or fr frontline workers, they say, you know, I could never talk about, I, I couldn't find a therapist to talk about because you'll never understand what I went through. And the good news with IFS therapy is I don't need to understand because guess who's doing the healing? You're healing you. Mm -hmm. Your self-energy is healing your wounded parts. And so I work with victims with you know, chronic incest, rape, sexual abuse, mistreatment, physical violence, chronic instability in their households. And the great news is I'm not the savior as the therapist. I'm not the healer. I'm the coach. As I described to them, it's like on a basketball court. I could be eight feet away and I'm helping you and I'm flooding the room with, you know, with guidance, with self-love and self-energy, but it's your self-energy, your self-love that is healing you and doing the healing. So you have to take the, you know, the elbows on the court, you have to shoot the three point shots, but I'm right there. I'm going to hold you, you know, in my, you know, my guidance and my embrace that way of energy as you go through this healing process. Well, at first I want to say that that was a really beautiful description of IFS and having used it with my therapist for the last seven years, I can say that it's extremely powerful. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. I'm glad that you've discovered it. I was excited to hear that. Yeah. That's been helpful for you. Yeah. And do you think that it would be useful to kind of go through a little scenario and climbing and just see how it plays out, how IFS plays out? Be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to do it. Um, would you like to do that with something that you are facing in recent, recently in the last month or so, or how would you like to set it up? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that'd be the easiest way to do it, but I, okay. because I do think that it's a tool that I also want to say that when we see therapists in movies and shows, I think that the portrayal of them is so dumb and inaccurate because they're always like, well, this is what I think you should do. And I am, the, I am yes. the expert here on your life. And that's not what therapy is about. It's never been about that for me. It's just like people asking good questions and having good insights. But yes, um, please kick me if you ever find me giving advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I save that for my family, which they, they don't want to hear. They don't even want to hear much as much, right? <laughs> I that. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no advice given in in, uh, in therapy or shouldn't, yeah. Shouldn't yeah. be. Yeah. And that's like I said, it's the self, the person's, you know, self healer opening up to help heal themselves and to heal their own wounds that way and to find the direction that they'd like to go with in their life. I have no idea what the best choices are for, for my clients, let alone myself necessarily. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of a situation, but I think I could just simply use an old situation that so many people can relate with about like being on a project, not sending the project feeling really frustrated by that and mm -hmm. feeling a lot of, you know, shame and low self-worth and worry and all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have a name for this route? Do you want to name it at all? Is it, is this one that you have not succeeded on or you did or. Sure. I mean, the, all, this whole coaching journey started when I was working on Tomb Raider and rifle. So let's start with that one. Okay, great. Rifle's Which I did not great. send. Rifle is a great place to explore the deeper woundings, which you may not be aware of in your life, but yeah, it's a, the place to see all the surface symptoms of our, <laughs> our lack of self-worth come out. Yeah. I've found it there many times. Myself. Yeah, we all yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a great vehicle. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned just at the start frustration. Uh, and if we go back to, let's call it, can we go back just briefly and we'll set a time limit on this for maybe 10 minutes or so to see what we find out, but just so people can see what's there. Are you comfortable bringing your awareness and your interest, your focus to one of the times where you felt, you mentioned frustration. So let's use that as a vehicle. And are you comfortable going back to one of the days or events there when you felt most frustrated? Um, yes. Okay. And is frustration still the emotion that you might feel? Is there something else that you feel in your body or in your mind as you travel back to that experience? There's a lot of shame for being physically incapable of doing sequences or, you know, links. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let me just check in. Is it okay? Check in with your system. You know, is it okay to be talking about this publicly? Are there any aspects or any parts of your system that do not feel okay with talking about this mm. or need a safeguard, you know, for, for no go areas in our discussion? No, my system is an open book. Okay, great. And we want to welcome anything that comes up that needs to put up some safeguards. Entirely helpful and welcome if it's here. Uh, okay, so shame's coming up. And when you travel back to that event there, if you can, as we go inside a little bit, where did you feel the shame in your body? Does it live in a certain It'll area of your body? Yeah, it always lives in my chest and my stomach, and it makes me sort of want to curl up disappear Not curl up and disappear yeah let me ask how do you feel toward and on that day or now as you go back to it how do you feel toward that shame that you feel in your chest and your stomach well i feel like the shame is me yes yeah and i'll step out here just to describe to listeners what's very common as we feel that when we're covered with shame and i feel the same when i have guilt or shame or anger we feel that it is us that it overtakes us and then with time and with perspective we realize that oh it was an aspect of us one of the many things that we have and just the fact that you can mention shame means that you have awareness of it mm -hmm. and if you've ever seen someone you know in anger they or they may not even be aware that they're in it or uh and so just the fact that you have this is a great step of awareness i just wanted to back out for a little yeah that's explanation great. for people mm -hmm. there and so you feel that that this shame is you yeah yeah okay? that makes a lot of sense i get that yeah okay and when you feel that shame do you like feeling it do you not like it would you do you want it to be there do you want it to go away no, it's incredibly uncomfortable. Comfortable. Okay. So you have the shame in your chest and your stomach. And there's another part of you that says this is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. And would we be willing to ask the part of you that feels that this is uncomfortable, if it would be willing to relax, to step back and to give you some space so that you could be with the discomfort of the shame directly? And we can let this part of you know that says, hey, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to touch it. We can ask this, even the shame, to tone it down. Tone down the feeling so it doesn't overwhelm you. Yeah. And this yeah, is a I technique we use in IFS. I'll describe, fascinatingly, we can ask these parts and whether clients are dealing with anxiety or other things, suicidality or whatever it is, we can actually ask those drives to tone down so we can bring our self-awareness to them. And a lot of times they'll respect our request. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something I've had to practice for sure doing IFS, mm -hmm. but I can, I can, I can ask it to go st take a step so, back. So ask the will. part that's uncomfortable with the shame. And it may also be uncomfortable in this, in this discussion, perhaps who knows. Step back so that you could be directly with that feeling of shame. there from the Tomb Raider shortcoming. Okay. And then where I'd go with this process, and we don't necessarily need to go there now, very curious, shame comes in a couple of different flavors. Sometimes it's a protector saying, you screwed up, you sh you're never going to be good enough, and it serves, we'll call a pro-social purpose in that it allows us to, if we've done something wrong, it's ostensibly in our tribe, you know, in our area, to atone, to put our head down and to, you know, move on. If let's just say, if we've acted out, raised or thrown a stone at somebody or whatever it is, it's like, oops, I'm really, really a shameful person here. I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to get low. I'm going to take the lashings and get through this until I can get accepted back in the tribe. Hmm. Other mm -hmm. times, Neely, shame is our most wounded self it's a helpless you know innocent part of us often from our childhood that is carrying shame and was shamed so in this therapy practice we would take some steps to discern whether this shame is actually protecting you and trying to serve as a manager 
to 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 you know to keep your status in the tribe to make you do better or if it's actually a wound that's tied back to some time in your earlier life and that needs the healing itself hmm what if it's both mm -hmm. sure can be it's a good question and i would say this would be an exploration for a you know for a therapy session and i i don't think we want to go into the weeds too much in it there uh, but shame can often present as a manager, as a, you know, call of a protective, as a quote, helpful part, protecting from a deeper wounding. Uh, and also it can be, um, the, you know, a wounded part itself. Mm -hmm. And what, the way we would find out is asking this shame is what is it afraid would happen if it wasn't shaming you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We would talk directly to it. We would gather your self-awareness and self-energy and say, okay. And we would learn. And if the shame says, well, Neely would be, you know, completely, you know, lose her status in the tribe. She'd be laughed out of rifle. You know, her friends would not want to climb with her anymore. or They'd think she's a total fraud. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. That shame is serving as a protector, a little kick in the pants to be like, hey, you suck. Get it together. Shame on you for, you know, coming up so short here at rifle on you know saturday september 15th or whatever it is in the busy day in the canyon or it's the childlike part that's carrying a deep wound and then we would do an unburdening and a retrieval we'd witness the pains that it carried in its earlier life go in there and kind of like a paratrooper mission we would go in witness it be with it during its hardest time of its pains witness the burdens that it's carrying allow it to have a redo from that time, probably in your childhood when it felt deeply shamed and then bring it up to the present moment and unburden it so that it could be free and no longer, this wounded part would no longer have to be stuck in the trunk of the car, you know, in the basement. Mm -hmm. And then interestingly, self-critic or other parts, these things would no longer, as we bring them, you know, self-awareness to your system would no longer have to act so vigilantly to protect you from shame. In the mm -hmm. wounds of shaming. Yeah. And I think another thing that happens in all of my sessions is my therapist will say, what does that part, what does the vulnerable part need from you now? And it's usually, you know, me saying to it, I love you no matter what. That's the core mm -hmm. of it. I love you no matter what, mm -hmm. or I accept you or you are doing the best you can or whatever, mm -hmm. something very basic. Yeah. And if you had the chance to witness its, its deepest woundings in the past and to liberate this wounded part from the past and bring it up to the, to be with you in the present now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That can be very powerful. Yeah. And sometimes we'll do that by, you know, having adult me talking to the child me where this shame first started occurring and just saying these things to that child part of me yeah and so in psychology we also say oh i have to connect with my inner child it turns out like many things um like the when i use the term ego it can present in many different ways our inner child it's not like layers of an onion where we find one you know core that we go to it's inner children often we have wounding from many different ways whether it's from a sibling or from a you know friend a, a friend or a difficult you know early dating relationship that really wounded us or other things that way Illness, um so it's yeah. we're going to our inner children yep um, and it's more like leaves on a, you know, on a plant, um, than layers of an onion. Yeah. Another way I might work that I would, and I'm always curious about as well. I love that. I never know the answers, but we stay curious as I would work with, um, EMDR therapy. If, if there was a particular difficult incident, right. That's stuck in your mind from, you know, failing on Tomb Raider on a certain day, let's say the most, you know, difficult moment of that time. And that also is carrying with it shame thoughts or shortcoming into your, you know, current and future life nearly. So, okay, we'd work and that. That's an acronym for eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing therapy. And that is using some bilateral tapping or eye movement as we talk about a traumatic situation to reprocess in much the same way that our REM sleep reprocesses stressors from our day. When we've had a traumatic experience for whatever reason it gets stuck in our mind and we just fire with this limited neural pathway of you know synapses of, of neurons in our brain we then engage 
bilateral stimulation, whether it's eye movement or tapping, while we reprocess a painful memory. And lo and behold, it's a little bit like brain magic, it reprocesses. So it's one of the, you know, the gold standard treatments for PTSD, you know, war veterans, sexual assault, those type of things. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you said that you work a lot with grief and loss in climbers. Well, in everyone, I imagine that that might be really helpful in a situation like that. Yeah. A lot of times I work with, I, I ask clients, we would just t put our toes in the water and see what modality works best for them, whether it's EMDR or internal family systems, or, you know, we, we can obviously do some top level cognitive behavior therapy, which I don't find heals wounds so much, but does a really nice job of top level management. Mm -hmm. um, and then we play a bit of jazz and say, what's, you know, what's right. Oh, I'm feeling like this is a single incident. That's really sharp. We can, we can, work with our parts around it. And then also maybe we'll do some EMDR. Mm -hmm. um, I find I have to do EMDR. I've had to do it myself with, I was really carrying a, a, one of the most horrific stories I've ever heard from a client that came in this month and I was having some trouble sleeping. And I guess maybe I was unprepared for the story. Usually I'm pretty good hearing very, very difficult stories. And this one, I just couldn't have ever dreamed up something like this of happening to anybody before. And I, I didn't even want to tell my IFS therapist about it. I didn't want to burden her with this mm. horrific description of things. So I ended up in the middle of the night when I was awake doing EMDR therapy on myself to reprocess this memory. And it worked really well. Wow. That's incredible yeah. that you can do that on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and just <clears throat> as a plug, oh, sorry, I'm a little sick. Just as a plug for EMDR, I did it. I had a terrible mushroom trip. Sorry. Hold on. <coughs> when I was a teenager and never did drugs again after that and couldn't really be around people on drugs or even talk about psychedelics without having a lot of anxiety. And I did EMDR on it and now I'm, I'm fine. I'm around people yeah. on drugs all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's still fine. Yes, you are in the front range of Colorado. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've used EMDR for a, uh, a, a very traumatic psychedelic experience myself too and found it helpful. Wow. Yeah. So this is, <laughs> we've gone down a rabbit hole here, but yeah. I mean, it's still, I, I think it's all, it's like, yes, we're climbers, but on the, on the outsides and the underneaths of the being a climber, we're just humans with trauma and like weird stuff going on. It's not even weird. It's normal. Yeah. Um, it's very normal. Yeah. And these are the things that we need to be healthier versions of ourselves. And I think that, you know, us talking about this stuff very openly, other people talking about therapy openly, it's just opening the doors for people. And I really appreciate that because I've been doing this for 20 years and, you know, it's cool to see so many other people doing it now. So yeah, I'm excited seeing you, you do it as well. I also think it plays a really great role in performance psychology. You know, if, if I was a, you know, if I was on an NFL team or whatever, I would absolutely have, you know, an EMDR or internal family systems or for both, you know, therapist on the team because, or in climbing, you know, if you take a bad fall, if there's any type of social stigmas or shames around some type of fall, or if it's something that scares you and you sprain your ankle find yourself as I've found myself in some really terrifying situations, ice climbing or multi-pitch rock climbing. Um, I've found EMDR and IFS to be wildly helpful for healing. For, and, I, and that's kind of what I did in a lot of my EMDR training is I took a bunch of my ice climbing and rock climbing traumas of kind of near-death experiences to the training. I think my fellow, you know, psychotherapist thought I was a you know, a nut job because I was going off to do another big ice climb. I think it was last winter during my EMDR training. I was about to go do a big ice climb and I was trying to heal from past ones. But what I found is I'm not doing that healing. I want to be very clear for people so that I can climb more dangerously or harder again. And so that I can bring more self-awareness and be free to have the discernment as to what's, what's right for me. So I'm not acting out of an imbalance. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. You're moving forward and maybe you're making different choices about how much risk you're going to take. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 
And let's just say for an example, if like, I'm happy to go back to myself, but for you, like if we were to uncouple the shame, you know, failing on a certain climb, it wouldn't mean, okay, now I'm free to try really hard and do more hard climbs and climb harder. That's going to be up to your discernment, to your self, you know, like discrimination to say what in my system, what is best for me hmm. might be that great. Now I'm free of shame. And so much of my emotional energy is free now to enjoy and love the process of climbing. You might climb harder or you might say, ah, that was an unwise decision or taking on a route of that kind, you know, actually isn't contributing to my greater life happiness. Mm -hmm. I'm going to back off. That's what happens when we become free with self-awareness, I'd say at times from good, you know, good self-help. Yeah. Yeah. The word free is really nice there. It like gives you perspective to freely choose instead of doing something out of habit or being in a rut with your behaviors. yeah i think you see that at all level of athletics and certainly in the climbing world people are acting out of habit and from an outside lens you know is this habit is this drive really serving their their best you know the best interest their their the richest wellness in their life yeah who knows they might say it is but that's because they're trying to manage their self-critic, their anxiety, their drive, their strive, not knowing that they have some deeper wounds that could, you know, relatively easily be liberated and they wouldn't have to act from the protection mode of yeah, self-worth. Yeah. It, it, it is. I mean, I could talk to you for like three more hours about this. Maybe we need to have a, yeah, this one. Have to, I, know, I think we'll be going. Yeah. But, um, I, I will say, I think that, you know, when, when I started working with Hazel, and just thinking about this stuff in general, I was very scared that I was going to lose my edge too. Like you said, um, I was like, no, if I don't have this self-loathing, then I'm not even going to want to climb. And it's true. I didn't want to climb for a while after I discovered this. I didn't, I yep. gave myself a break, but I think it was a much needed break from the trauma that I had inflicted on myself. And it's like micro trauma, but you know, from loathing myself for so many years I did need a break but now like a year two years later I finally am like yes I want to try hard again and I am ready to do that from a very different place and when I am climbing now I'm climbing harder than I was before and with more confidence and I'm having more fun and more flow and I'm it's just so much easier than it was before because there's no, there's very little shame attached to it anymore. So it just like flows out of me now. And I didn't believe that that was going to happen. And, you know, Hazel kept saying that it would, and I was like, that's stupid. And now I see it and I'm so happy, but I just wish that everybody could experience that, you know? Yeah, it's true. And it sounds silly, but I went to a trip to the Red River Gorge last October, November, and the usual thing is questions is, oh, cool. What, what routes do you want to climb? Or, you know, what do you want to do there? And my answer was like, it hardly matters. I'm there for the joy of it. And it's not that I'm going to just climb, you know, five times, but I'm a, with a group of maybe five other people. I just have the wisdom to know that we're going to go to whatever crag. And if it's raining, we're going to go to, you know, a certain crag that, or if it's not, we'll go to this one. If it's cold or sunny or warm, we'll go to different crags. My mission is just joy. Yeah. And I'm um, wise enough now to know that there's not joy in the object. Like there's not joy in a certain route at the Red River Gorge. And if I cling onto that, I have to do that on November 4th, that that's going to bring life happiness for me. So I'm, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be open to whatever is best at that day. That's going to provide the best experience, you know, for myself and my friends, because yeah. that's what I'm after. I'm after joy, not right. the object. Yeah. And you're not going to be pissed off anymore. If like your friend's objectives get in the way of your objectives or correct. You're yeah. Just gonna yep. go with the flow. Yeah. I have roots. I want to do. I know the names and all that. Of course I look on mountain project, have a blast, you know, I spend, you know, a lot of time in the evenings before looking at the roots that I want to do and that's there. And I have no idea what the four other people will have climbed, you know, in the few days before I got there, what the weather's going to do, or if other people are on the route and I'm not going to sit around being third, you know, of my rope bag waiting for some route when I'm sitting, you know, at the, <laughs> <laughs> the literal mother load or whatever it is of roots, yeah. just get on, you know, have fun, have well, joy. And while I th think that there's <laughs> definitely room for that kind of climbing where you are just having fun, 
Um, I also think that within this mindset, you can work on very hard things for yourself too. And that's actually my plan for these next Absolutely couple right. seasons is and but I, it's different in that I'm not like, I have my sights set on a couple of routes that I'm going to try that are very hard for me, but it's not because I'm like, I need to send those to prove to everyone that I can or to myself. The objective is simply to go out there and practice a new mindset, practice trying hard, practice breathing through hard things, practice overcoming fear, like practice the process so that I can get better at the process, not necessarily send. Like, I don't care if I send actually, but so I do think that, and and I think that if I do that process, well, the, the like side effect could be sending. And that would yes. be great. But I, so it's just like a complete paradigm shift for me and we'll see how it goes. I think you said it perfectly. I couldn't say it better. And that's the process of what I would sum up of what I'm hearing and what I've learned myself is being open to the process of growth and open, let's call it what, you know, what they might say in the Buddhist tradition of the causes of joy. Hmm. The causes of joy are, you know, commitment to yep, self-awareness, to growth, to learning, to also to gratitude for the opportunities we have. Um, and if you fall or fail on a route, there is an infinite amount of great learning and growth to be had from that. And can you be open to that rather than letting the critic run the ship? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that's, I'm just recapping what you said that I really, what I really liked. Yeah. Well, do you feel like there's anything else pressing that you want to talk about? No, I think it's probably a good a good summary yeah a good place to to pause okay how about you i mean i feel i could personally talk about this stuff forever but i i think that we can let people sit with what we've talked about and and yeah close yeah close with this but um i can talk about it forever too my wife has to put the tea up and call time out <laughs> when I come back with new insights or new therapy modalities or new things like, Oh my God, did you realize I've been doing this? And actually the deeper cause of that is this or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. She's like, okay, I just, I'm just doing the dishes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She's just coming back from teaching 102 seventh grade math students. Oh in gosh. Yeah, public school. Is. So yeah, she doesn't have a lot more bandwidth for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my fascinations That's beyond funny. the 15 minute mark or so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to thank you very much for coming on being so well spoken about this stuff. Like you've obviously put so much thought and care into this new profession of yours and I mean, I can't imagine that you're not doing a great job with your, with your practice. So thank yeah, you for thanks. being vulnerable and coming on and for, um, yeah, for, for asking to be on the show because I wouldn't have known who you were. And now I'm really glad that I do. Yeah. No, I introduced myself. I've loved, loved your show truly. And what, what you're doing, your vulnerability, uh, your work as a coach and just sharing your life process, um, and I also love equally, you know, the call it the micro beta of the training and the hangboard protocols and those things. And those are really helpful for me too. So yeah. it's all great. Thanks for the full, you know, the full range of humanity that you bring, Neely. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully I'll see you out there and um, thank you again. Yeah, I sure will. See you here climbing in Colorado or beyond. <laughs>